Welcome to the Time Out Coaching Podcast. Today, we have one of the true legends of British basketball coaching. With over 50 years of experience in the game, winner of numerous national schools and underage titles, a coach who has developed players at the highest level and who has run one of the top clubs in the BBL, please welcome Coach Mike Burton. Hi, Mike. How are you? Hi, Tony. Thank you very much for including me in this uh, prestigious uh, podcast. No, <laughs> listen, the, the, the real honor is mine. Um, I've known you. Uh, actually, we're gonna, I'm going to tell you a story a little bit afterwards. But, uh, you know, first, I always ask this question. Um, you know, you've been there, you know, really for, for the forefront of the game, you know, almost um, in its inception. But um, where, did, where were you introduced to the game of basketball? And, um, you know, just tell me that story, because obviously um, it's such an interest in, you know, uh, a, a story to, to find out. Right, well, I, I grew up playing rugby. I loved rugby. I played county rugby. And um, I went to teach a training college in Liverpool in the late 60s, uh, not having done any basketball at all. Um, and uh, I went there to do uh, maths and physics, um, but uh, looked at some of the guys on the PE program and thought, well, if they're good enough, you know, I could do that. So I asked whether I could swap from and do PE. So I did maths and PE and really enjoyed the PE, really enjoyed the teaching practices and did lots of, um, of, of coaching uh, awards. Didn't do a basketball one, did a volleyball one with uh, George Bowman, who was very prominent at the time. And I did an FA Coach Award soccer uh, one with, with Tom Saunders from Liverpool FC. Um, and there was 24 of us did that award and only three of us got it. And I wasn't even football. I wasn't good at football, but I could talk. Um, and when I left college, uh, I managed to get on Camp America and go to America to coach soccer in a summer camp. So I went the summer of uh, 1970, when I just finished college, uh, did three months in America and uh, did very well. Um, didn't lose any, any games at all in, in the, uh, uh, the varsity games against all the other camps around. And uh, we were always put in tandem with the, with the basketball team. So we'd go, we'd play our soccer game and all the basketballs would come and watch us and cheer us on and then, we go over and watch the basketball game and watch the I accidentally pressed um, the wrong thing. So uh, really got interested in basketball, really liked it. I liked the involvement that a coach had, the way the coach could uh, really involve himself in the game. And so when I came back from... Um, America in uh, mid-September, started teaching, teaching primary school, um, but started a basketball team in the town um, and uh, uh, at the local youth centre. And that's how I got introduced to basketball. And at this time, so you, you got introduced to the game. What was the the next stage for you? You know, did you did you take the coaching award? Um, because at this time in, in certainly in Liverpool, just across the, the Mersey, there was, you know, really active basketball, you know, with, you know, obviously Jimmy Rogers and, you know, the ATAC stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. still learning about that history, but there was a yeah. there was a good involvement there. There was, yeah, there was great involvement. I, well, I really got into it. I loved the game. So I went on coaching uh, courses at the Blackpool Easter School. So you do uh, a week, you pay. You pay to, to, to a hotel for a week, bed and breakfast thing. Um, and you do a course for the whole week. So I did my level one there. I did my level two there with uh, Vic Ambler. Wow. Um, and I, I entered a team, uh, got, got a men's team going locally. Entered them in the Merseyside League. We entered in the fourth division of the Merseyside League. I can remember the first uh, first year we played um, against uh, Bolton Buccaneers, and I couldn't figure out when I got the fixture list why we, we we played away both games. We didn't have a home game, and it was the prison. It was Walton Jail, wow. so we had to go to the jail and play them. <laughs> and that was an interesting one. The yeah. the, uh, the warders did the did the referee, and they never called a foul. I mean, I mean, they'd blow and just give you a sideline, but it wouldn't say it was a foul on one of their guys. You know, yeah, didn't do that. Yeah. 
Um, and we won the fourth division the first year and then won the third division, then won the second division and went into the first division. So in the first division, there was there was Vaughan, Vaughan Thomas with his team. Um, there was uh, the Liverpool police team, which were very, very good. They had some really good players who played for Vaughan Thomas's team in the first year of um, what, what, became, what, what eventually became the BBL as Bruno Roughcutters. So we used to go and started in 1972. We used to go over to the D-Side Leisure Centre because that was the only decent sports centre, which was in Wales. But they played in the uh, in, in the top league. So there was Avenue and Loughborough All-Stars and uh, uh, Crystal Palace, and teams like that. So we, we had some good basketball to watch. And we used to play against these guys in, in midweek. So my team got, got to be pretty good. We had a, we, we recruited some good players and we played in that uh, in that third in that, in that first division of the Merseyside League, as I say, people like Jimmy Rogers and that were outstanding. You know. Yeah. And were you at this time, did you start to think about, you know, look, I'm, I'm enjoying this coaching. I'm going to start taking this a little bit further. Where, where, where was the, the next stage? Because of course well, you, you went to senior school. Well, at what, when, 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 yeah, when was what that? happened was I did two years in primary. And then I got headhunted to go and teach because I was doing a lot of basketball locally. Um, and I was refereeing this, all the school games as well, going around. I really just immersed myself in basketball in any which way. And I was refereeing all the games. And uh, basically the, uh, the local high school, local Catholic high school, um, phoned me up on a Friday night and said, there's a PE job going, you didn't apply for it. I said, no, well, I've had two years in primary now, even though I trained for secondary, I didn't think, I think, didn't think I'd have a chance. Well, are you interested in the job? I said, well, yeah. Right, okay. Interview Monday morning. So went along on the Monday morning and got the job. Um, and then I started teaching uh, in the PE department and really got into the basketball, just loved it. So I was doing high school basketball. Um, and the basketball was going really well uh, at the high school. Uh, we were starting to to get some uh, really good players and uh and I got them involved with Liverpool. Liverpool had a team in the top league, um, coached by um, uh, Mike Warman was coaching them, and uh, uh, they had uh, they had some Mike Pyatt, They had some really good players, wow. and they used to come along. And I I used to, I mean, I was totally immersed in it. So at school, we used to train lunch times, after school, weekends, but we used to train every morning as well. School started at nine o'clock, but I'd have them all in at eight o'clock. So. We had a we had a really good facility. We had a double court sports hall and a gym in the uh, oh, we with basketball facilities. So I'd get all the kids in at eight o'clock and we'd we'd go from eight till nine training. Every my mother was the caretaker. Uh, sorry, was was the cleaner in the sports hall. So the kids could go in at break times and lunch times. And when I'd nip off for me lunch into the canteen, she'd make sure nobody messed around, you know. And so the kids could have access all the time to shooting and shooting and shooting. And the school became very, very good at basketball. And to the extent that Liverpool used to come along and train, they wanted the extra training. Uh, and so Mike Pyatt and Leroy Shaw and people like that used to come at eight o'clock and train with us, shoot around. The kids would all think this was fantastic, you know. So we started a real sort of basketball academy without it being an academy, if you like, you know. It's funny because uh, two, two, you know, prestigious you know, coaches in, in the UK have actually, that's what they exactly termed you. They said you were the academy before an academy, which is uh, really <laughs> well, interesting. Uh, it's, it's actually, you, you've said that yourself. So it's, it, 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 of course. So um, what what year are we talking about here now? We're starting, you know, mid, mid 70s, getting into the, to the older 70s. Where, yeah. what, which, where are you moving? Are you, late, and also- Late 70s. Uh, yeah. I'd, I'd got introduced to Joe Forber uh, in the early 70s. And uh, me and Joe, For Joe Forber started a junior team at Stockport Belgrade uh, with, with Bill Bezik. Well, Bill Bezik was coaching the senior team. And uh, we were coaching a junior team over there uh, in the uh, uh, late 70s, early 80s. Um, I took one of my school teams to America in 1979 for three, month, three weeks uh, because I was desperate to get an England player. I didn't have any England players. And I thought, the way to do this is, is to run a trip to America, get these kids really, really keen, get over there, go to a really top camp. So we went to, to the Duke camp in the Poconos for two weeks. We, we raised money 
for 10 months. We raised 10,000 pounds in 1979, me and the parents and the kids. And uh, we were 21, 21 of us went over there, three staff and 18 kids. Um, and when we came back, we, uh, we went to the, the very first under 14 um, invitation schools basketball tournament. Pete Mintoff organised it in Birmingham. He invited the top eight teams in the country um, and the England coaches were there. And Larry Meek was there as you know, an American professional player sort of handing the awards out, that sort of thing. And we won that tournament. Uh, and four of my players um, play, got in the England under-15 team. And I took two coach loads of kids to watch England versus uh, Ireland in Coventry. And all four of them started. One of them was captain and one of them was vice captain. And the vice captain was Ben Thomas's dad, Gary Thomas. He was wow. vice captain of England. <laughs> so look at him now, you wouldn't believe it. Don't, don't tell him I said that. But, um, he was vice captain of England. Another one of my players was captain. And all four of the players started. And the other player that started was a, was a kid from Blue Coach in Liverpool. They had a very good team as well. So yes, it was a indeed. bit of a hotbed of basketball in this area. And we started then to uh, to get involved really, in, you know, in junior basketball. So those kids went over with me. Um, over to Manchester and we trained in Stockport with Joe Forber and started a junior team there. And that was the start of a, you know, a really incredible relationship and more importantly to develop these, you know, super high level players. You know, you, you definitely yeah. had yeah. some great players coming from that program. Um, just on the, just on the instance, I do want to tell this, even though it is my own personal story and you don't know this story, but um in I would have thought it would have been 1983. I want to say that because I would have been 14 years old. I played in that invitational tournament, but it was held, if I'm not mistaken, in Blue Coat or Blue Coat hosted it. Either you or Blue Coat hosted it. Um, but I remember it was in Liverpool. Um, and I was there with my school. We were we had won the national championship that year. Um, Warwick boys who became Sir George Monarchs and we we had two England players and you know some of us were going to Hemel some of us were going to East London Royals but the funny part of that story is we played um, Jack Singer and Hackney in the final and the person that missed the free throw to win the game is is, is sitting here at this moment that's a true story right. Um, right. I, missed the, I missed two free throws to to win the win the tournament and Hackney won by right. I've, 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 well that Blue Coat at the time when he had a little gym, so that was at our school. That, was. that, that would was have been at your Coat. school. I would have thought yeah, it would have been. School, yeah. Yeah. And um, it had a lot to do with Jack Singer because he, he had the, the Baker twins and the, exactly, yeah. those sort of guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah it was Andrew yeah. Andrew Bailey and Ronnie instead. He was the was, yeah. was that team. So yeah, it was. Uh, those were those were incredible days. So sorry, we digressed there. Oh, I wanted yeah. to put that story in because uh, uh, you, I'd never told you that personally either. But. Um, <laughs> So you, so you're at Stockport with Joe, um, yeah. and you're you're obviously you know starting to. I'm assuming you're starting to take some of the best talent of the the whole of the Northwest, and people are starting to gravitate towards you. Um, the talent was coming towards Joe and myself, yeah, because we were running pretty good programs. Um, and uh, at one stage, well, what happened was. I got then recruited by Liverpool to go and coach Liverpool in, in, the, in the BBL. That was my first start. I think that was around about 80, 84. Um, but the, the, the situation with Manchester Giants um, were, uh, were coached by Bob, um, uh, Bob, Bob from Doncaster, Bob Martin from Bob Doncaster Martin, yeah. as a player yeah. coach. Wow. And he was, they, they were much better than us. Uh, as a team but he was struggling because he was a player coach and he was doing it all and it, it, it was making him ill he was getting exhausted and they were calling ambulances and and the owner of Manchester Giants contacted me and asked me whether I would come over and, and be Bob's assistant at the time I was coaching I was a head coach at Liverpool but it, it wasn't going very well um, for issues that I won't go into um, so I went over to Manchester and uh, and coached for um, for half half the season, the second half of the season in 84, 85. Um, and then at the end of the season, um, Mr. Madani, the, the owner, asked me whether or not uh, um, who was the best coach in the country that he could bring in, because he was desperate, he was really keen. And at the time, the person who was doing, getting all the numbers was Tom Becker up at Sunderland. Sure. He was doing a great job. 
So we interviewed Tom Becker and he took the job and Tom got the job and I was his assistant, but I was also coaching the junior team. That was always the great thing. So I was learning. I was the assistant to a, a, an American coach. But the things I was learning, I was putting into action with the junior program and at the school. Yeah. So I was with Tom for two years and then um, Tom left. He went to France and coached in France. Kev Cadle came for a year. Kev coached. I was his assistant for a year, which was fantastic. And then Kev went to Kingston. And the two teams in Manchester, Manchester Giants and Manchester United, merged. That's right. And Joe Welton had the job as, um, as head coach. And he invited me to be his assistant. So I went for two years at Manchester United to be... Um, Joe's assistant. Um, now, when I was with Manchester Giants, we'd gone in the, uh, the Korak Cup. So I got to, to travel around Europe, learning a lot in those situations, playing games. Um, and Manchester United entered the Korak Cup as well and, uh, and made the semi-final pool. Now, the, the semi-final pool was eight teams, two semi-final pools of eight teams. So you played home and away to seven teams. So it was, I mean, I managed to get time off school, unpaid, but I got time off school. And just learned so much in those situations, traveling around Europe, playing against teams like Benfica, um, Paris, uh, um, uh, Racing Club de Paris, um, Italian clubs, Greek clubs. We went to play ben Benfica in Portugal. We played pa Paris and Icas. Uh, it was just a great learning situation. Just, just take it just one half, one step back before before you got involved with you know those yeah. high level coaches that you talked about um what were you what were you basing your philosophy on at that moment were you heavily de developing the fundamental skills um did you play a certain type of basketball who was your influences early on and then i'm assuming you started picking up stuff from from those really experienced coaches my influence always uh, and all the way through and still is, and I've spoke to the guy again today, twice, it was Joe Forber. Joe really influenced me. Uh, uh, and, and it was all about fundamentals, fundamentals, fundamentals. And Joe never left a stone unturned. When we first started coaching, the force in junior basketball in Britain was Roy Packham at, uh, at Crystal Palace. Crystal Palace. And, and uh, Joe just said to me, um, whatever Joe asked me to do, I, I was, and I was, we had years where I was his assistant and then years where he was my assistant. Uh, we had some great uh, times together. We went to three court finals at the Royal Albert Hall, which were outstanding. But whenever Joe said, you know, he wanted to do something, I, he asked me to do it, you know. <laughs> um, and I, I would do it, you know, because I just, I really, really reckon he, he was, he knew his stuff. So Joe said, look, let's arrange a meeting with Roy Packham. Let's find out what he does. What's he doing? What makes him so good? Um, so I phoned Roy. And he said, well, there's nothing really to say. You know, he said, well, look, we want to come down. We're going to drive down to London. And we want to sit down with you. And we want to pick your brain. OK. But it's not a lot to tell. I said, OK, fine. So we went down to London, uh, me and Joe. And we sat with Roy. Um, and uh, basically, what really came across was how hard he worked. He trained four nights a week. He got the best talent. They used to travel from miles away. He had the Clark brothers traveling from, from the coast up to Crystal Palace on a train. They were really good students. As well. They used to do the homework on the train going up. Two hours, really intensive training, do the homework going back. Um, and they used to get lots of games in and lots of tournaments. And I always ran lots of tournaments because I had that sports hall that you actually went to. Um, <laughs> so we started doing uh, late, Late 70s, early 80s, we do under-19 tournaments at Christmas. Uh, and we, we, we had, because I was running basketball camps, the, the, the Cheshire, Cheshire Dead yeah. basketball camp at the time. We had bed, we had beds, so we used to put them up in the classrooms and we'd invite teams. So we'd have teams from Holland and uh, Ireland and Scotland and, and Roy Packer would bring his teams up and uh, we'd get a lot of really good under-19 competition. And that's what sure. we had. And we, because we were having such good competition and good coaching, the juniors gravitated towards us from all over the Northwest. We got kids from all over the Northwest coming to it. Parents would invest their time, just like so, what Packham was doing. With what, the, the what were some of those um, those st standout names? I'm assuming Dave, Dave Gardner was one of the first, Dave, was Dave it? Dave Gardner, Robbie Pierce. Those two both came from over my side. Uh, over on Joe's side, obviously, John Amici. 
Um, there, there was some uh, uh, the, the Andrew Thompson. Uh, there were some real standouts, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But there were lots of solid players as well who, who would work really hard. And, and we just basically based the philosophy on fundamentals, 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 at pace, up the floor, in your face. Um, the sort of thing that Roy Packham was doing, you know, you, you recognize, recognize how successful it was, you know. That's awesome. Um, and then did you, so then you, you start uh, gaining some more experience. Obviously, you're getting experience from everywhere, but you're starting to work with, um, you know, people like, you know, Kevin Cadle and Joe Welt and all these American, these American coaches. Are you starting to get some things? Like you said, you started to put some of those things in into the juniors uh, teams to the to the school teams. Did you what were what were some of those things that you learned from those coaches? Learn different things from different coaches. Um, t- t- Tom Becker was was all about fundamentals, real fundamentals. But he wasn't a motivator at all. He believed that you paid them a good amount of money, and they, they had to be motivated themselves. Which I found an issue with when I worked with Kev Cadle, because Kev Cadle was unbelievable <laughs> motivator, incredible, unbelievable, uh, fantastic uh, guy, um, and. Uh, and very, very thorough. Um, so the motivational side, I worked with Kevin, and he used that with with, with juniors and with school kids. And uh, I can remember meet, meeting some of the kids, some of the guys now who are men, and they've got they've got youngsters in our in our program and in Joe's program over in Manchester Magic. Uh, and I see people like um, uh, Andy Lang and that, and, and he, he always says to me, "But you know, if it's up to me, it's got to be." You know, because Kev Cadle had this thing where we used to go around to each player and he'd go to the big guy and say, you're going to get every rebound today. Nobody's going to take a rebound off you. You're going to go both ends of the floor. You're going to get every rebound because if it's up to me, it's got to be. And he moved to the guard and tell him what he had to do because if it's up to me, it had to be. And I just used those things with the uh, with the juniors. And then Joe Welton. Um, Joe was, was different than both of those guys. Joe Welton was... He, he, he was... A, he was a real offensive coach. And defensively, what he would do is he'd change up, change up, change up, change up. He never really worked hard on the defense like Kev Cadle did. Kev Cadle's defense was absolutely Crazy. outstanding, Crazy. And solid. And, and, yeah. uh, I still uh, use a couple of those drills now. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's got some great drills. But Joe Welton would, would play man to man. And if he going through a bad patch, he'd change to a 2 1 2 zone. Going through a bad patch, he'd go triangle and two. Going through a bad patch, go one three one zone. He just change it, change it, change it, change it. And as he changed it, the opposition would take time to adjust. And once they once they adjusted, he'd change again. And so you know, you brought that into the uh, equation. So lots and lots of different things that I learned from people and just used them whenever I, you know, I needed to. Kev Cadle had a great um, match up zone defense, where the the, the trigger was. Two passes and you were in you were in man to man in the matchup and I used that a lot. I'd never come across a matchup zone before. Um, so you know you, you just pick things up and try them out. And I was able, I was fortunate because I was I wasn't just an assistant coach on the floor with a senior team. I was coaching other teams as well. Sure. Lots of them, lots of them. I mean, my school program was going great. We were winning lots and lots of things. And, uh, we had some really good players at school, so I was using all that stuff with them. But I could try it out with them as well. That's, I think, um, su- uh, such an underrated uh, factor for, for these young coaches in this day and age. I think they just don't understand, you know, repetition and the amount of times you need to be on the floor. And just, you know, like I've you know, said in the past on this podcast, the, the amount of games I coached in London Junior League and, um, you know, all of those, you know, underage leagues just to, you know, I must have had like 2,000 free five before I even got to the to any type of level. So it's just, you know, it's such a, such an advantage and a help. And that's what I try and tell these young coaches. Well, we, we had, we had eight teams in national schools competition. <laughs> and at some stage or other, I coached all those teams. I mean, I did have some help. Um, Jimmy McGinn did a good job with the girls. He came in and coached the girls, did a great job. Um, we had some really good girls teams. And I was coaching some of the girls teams at school as well. Um, and uh, I mean, we, 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 had, we had 
uh, uh, younger teams as well, year seven, year eight. And then we had the under 14s, under 15s, under 16s, under 19s. And I believe we were the only school ever to win every single um, school title. Um, but boys and girls, all eight titles. And in fact, in 2005, um, we were in every single final. As we poor Catholic High School was in every single English school's final and we won five of them. Funnily enough, the one we lost was under 16s. And in that team, I only had two year 11s. The rest were year 10s. And the two year 11s were Ben Thomas and James Bryce. Ben Thomas wow. is our head coach. Yeah. James Bryce is now our, uh, our general manager, general manager of, yeah. of the Chelsea Phoenix. And we lost that game to Reddish Vale from um, Stockport, a uh, school from Stockport. They were coached by a lad called Mike Briggs, who'd gone to Chester College and did his teaching practice at my school. And I mentored him for basketball at my school. And he went off and started basketball. So at the end of the game, we'd lost by seven. I remember shaking hands with him and having mixed feelings. I was upset we'd lost the game, but was absolutely made up that somebody I'd mentored had actually won a national title. Awesome. So, Great story. Yeah. So from this, uh, you know, from this period in the 80s and it comes into the 90s, where did the Chester, the Chester Jets um, project, what, what, was that always in the back of your mind to produce? Uh... No, not at all. Not at all. What happened was uh, 1989, um, I'd been six years in, uh, in, in Manchester and Manchester United pulled out because of the the Hazel problem with Liverpool in the European Cup, all the European football, all English European teams were banned from going into Europe. So Manchester United were losing money and they decided not to put the money into the basketball team. So they pulled the plug on the on the basketball team and they'd had the team for about four years. Rick Taylor was at the time was, was the team manager. Yeah. And he went down to London Towers. Um so they went back to be Manchester Giants and Jeff Jones was going to coach Manchester Giants. Um, and I was asked by the, uh, the chairman of the, uh, the, the Jets, Chester, the Chester Jets or Ellesmere Port Jets as they were at the time, whether I would come back and coach in, in my hometown, which is where I lived anyway, I was traveling. And I said I would. So I came back and started coaching in 1989, the, uh, the team. And they were in the, uh, what was, Currently, Division One of the National League, like the second division, if you like. Um, and we went in there with an all English policy. We um, we decided we weren't going to go with Americans. Um, and I always said, if, if we won the league, we would go up to the BBL because there'd been a history of teams winning the league, particularly Brixton, with uh, with Jimmy um, winning the league and not going up to the BBL. The BBL was getting a little bit thin on the ground. They only had seven teams in the BBL. That's right, yeah. So we actually were fortunate enough with some good players with Dave Gardner and uh, Jason Crump and John Amici and those guys playing for us. We were fortunate to uh, to win the league and so we elected to go up. So in 1991, the second year with the, the Jets, we won the low, the, 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 what was the second division and went up into what became the BBL. Wow. Just We've been in there ever since. Just before we, I want to talk about the whole BBL, you know, the, the, the team and in the top league and then the BBL. What I've got that question that I, I wanted to ask you. I mean, the, uh, traditionally, the Northwest has, has been, you know, a power base for, for producing players. I mean, you know, just not, not, we're not just talking about the, the John Amici's, you know, with, you know, just think about Chris Haslam. Um, right. I, I mean, there's a whole series of them that are played absolutely at the highest level. Um, you know, Kevin Penny, all of these guys that, um, that played, you know, for England, for Great Britain, um, they played uh, high-level professional basketball. What, what was, you know, Delmi, or, or what was the, what do you think was the reason? Do you think it was the culture, was the, the fact that there was, you know, it was a good structure, there was good structures, or, or, or what, 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 any, any thoughts? Well, well, first of all, Kevin Petty was from Birmingham. Dave Fisher, coach oh. Kevin. And then he moved up here. He got married to a girl at Warrington and he moved up here. But he, he learned his game in, in Birmingham. I have to say that, first of all. Nice. But the other guys, yeah, they were all... But it, I think I hinted at it before. It was the sort of program. And, and uh, um, uh, when I was at Giants, I was running a junior program. Joe was running a junior program then at United for two years before 
I went there. So for two years there, Joe had a great program. I had a great program. And people were drawn in because uh, we were connected with a, a BBL team, a top team in the country, and people wanted to recognize that and wanted to go to that and join that. And equally, um, we were running a, a pretty good pretty good program and taking teams abroad. We'd go to tournaments you know, on the continent. Um, and so people wanted to get involved in that. They were, they were just drawn to the programs. Well, how, how come, though, um, you were always able to recruit size? I mean, you know, everyone can say, oh, we always recruited uh, the athletes in London. It's true. But, that, that you know, it's a little bit easier. Um, you know, you guys always had, you know, the, the biggest players. Was was that just something that – was that something you went out? You went out and well, found those you – know, ex- those... You couldn't do it now. But back in the old day, I used to walk up to people in the street yeah. and say, you know, um, are you interested in playing basketball? How big are your feet? What size shoes have you got? And how tall is your dad? <laughs> now, you couldn't do that. <laughs> but in those days, you should just do it. Yeah. I used to invite them to come along. Um, I can remember coaching Alan Bannister, you know. Yeah, seven Alan Bannister. Five, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, we used to just find them. We'd, we'd go and find them. Pluto? Um, yeah, Pluto. Yeah, Pluto. Chris King. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, that's I, it's just a general question, but uh, you know, it's no question that um, there was just incredible. There was a big, big amount of talent that came from from the northwest. So, um, so in in the nineties, now you you win you win the what was was division two old division kind of a division one situation. You go up into the top league. Um, Am I right in thinking you you kept the all English policy, or you were you were <laughs> trying to keep the all English policy? We kept the all English policy for eleven games. We got <laughs> blown out in all eleven games. Did a U turn, brought in two Americans, uh, turned it around a little bit, won three games, held our own because we could see a situation where we'd be straight back down. They did say, "Look, you're not competitive." Um, so yeah, we, we went with Americans. Um, and that was that was the start. Then we we had Americans from then on, you know, brought in. Well, we, we didn't. It wasn't just Americans. We brought in Russians at one stage. Brought two Russians in. But that was another story. Right. And you had coached the team for for how many years? Ten years. Ten years. And that and on. I'm assuming on the ten year after ten years, that's when you you handed over to Robbie. Is that is that right? Or yeah. Well, I had Robbie was assistant for me. I mean, Robbie. Well, he played for me as, as, as a lad. Absolutely. He didn't go to my school. He, he went to another uh, local school. But I used to, I used to coach the the Northwest Cheshire team as well as the the, 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 the high school team. So we get more competition because most of the players were my players. So like uh, when Robbie Robbie had a player, another lad at his school called Simon Coombs, and they were like four miles from me. So they'd come and train with us, and then my team and those two would go and, and we'd play. Inter area games against uh, against London and against um, uh, Birmingham schools and Liverpool schools and Manchester schools, um, and uh, you know just to get extra competition. You know, I mean, I've got an interesting story you might like. Um, back in the day, under 14s, we played individual schools in 19, uh, 1981, uh, and we won the individual schools competition with my school team, uh, the, the Wilkinson School. And we also played in the Inter-Association. Um, and we, we ended up playing in the final against London. And I had a, an outstanding player. I mean, I had four England players in this team as well. Different team than Gary Thomas's and, and team. But I had a kid called Vic Fleming. I don't know whether you've ever heard of Vic. Of course, Vic. I know Vic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, Vic, we played in the, 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 the final. And we played against London schools. And Steve Buckner was playing for London schools. Now, to be fair, he hadn't been playing very long, but Steve, Vic, Vic came when Vic, Vic came to Catholic high school. He was six foot one in year seven, and he never grew. He ended up he's about six foot two now, uh, and, he, and but he was outstanding player, outstanding player. And in the in the, the school's final, Vic marked Steve, but known Steve marked Vic, and Steve scored eight points, and Vic scored fifty two. <laughs> 52, 52 points, points. Well, in, a, in an under 14 final, and then uh, the, well, the rest is history. Uh, Vic, 
<laughs> put on a bit of weight, but was still a heck of a player. Because yeah. when he was under 19, he was playing for Joe at Manchester uh, United right. yeah. and, um, and and got the uh, Junior Cup final player. Um, That's right. So he, he was a top player in the Junior Cup final. And he was um, in, he became a really solid coach as well. Really good coach. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Outstanding coach. Yeah. Outstanding. Very good. Very, very good. So you, at this time, in this just in this ten year period, what was what was changing? Did you change some stuff um, from your coaching philosophy? Um, what what was some of the things you started to to realize coaching the professional players? Um, and any any things that stand out there from a coaching standpoint? I found it very difficult to change my coaching philosophy from coaching year sevens to coaching men. I'm a shouter, a screamer, I'm in your face. And some players can take it and some can't. Uh, I didn't really change uh, my approach to, to coaching um, a lot, to be honest. But I found it tough because um, I wasn't just coaching the team. I was teaching full time and I was running the club and raising the money to, 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 to pay the players and, and run the, the team. And it was tough. And I recognised that it was tough. And I had this this junior, uh, this lad who'd come through the junior programme, Robbie Pierce, who was my assistant, who was really good. I could see just how good he was. And my last year of coaching, there were 12 teams in the league, 11 American coaches and me and Robbie. Wow. You know, they were all American coaches at the time. You know, Joe Fernando, Nick Nurse, all these guys, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, and... Uh, Chris. I knew that Joey, that, that, that Robbie could be a player, could be a coach. I knew he could be a really good coach and no one was going to give him a job. They were all American coaches. So I moved aside. I concentrated more on, on raising more money to support him, letting him be the head coach. And I was his assistant. Uh, and that's when we were really successful. He was a better coach than me. I mean, and he, he won any trophies. He was outstanding, and including... The jet wash year in 2001, 2002, where we won all four trophies at the BBL. He was outstanding. I mean, he he can he learnt a lot. You know, he, he he was he was my assistant for two or three years, and he pick picked everything up. Plus, I was sitting at his side, and I'd, I'd mention this thing, I'd say things, and whatever I said, he did it. I felt a bit embarrassed. You know, I'd say zone help us now. He'd call time out, put a zone on, thinking you know, you know, <laughs> and, and and he he was his own man. Yeah. He recognised that you know that I had some experience and uh, what what was, and he was um, very, very what was Robbie's first year? Was it two thousand or was it ninety nine? Uh, I think it was ninety nine. Yeah. yeah, because yeah, then on, in, in two thousand, I mean the first year or so, so he yeah. didn't do that great. He didn't recruit great players, and he, he he went with the philosophy then after a bit of getting some athletes, getting some serious athletes, and getting some serious sides. Um, and he started to, he was a great recruiter. He could charm the birds out of oh, the trees. He, I mean, we ended up with Lauren Meyer, well, who, who'd had four years in the NBA. His previous salary had been had been $2 million, and we got yeah. him for £200 a week uh, because he'd, he'd had two to family well, problems. If, he'd had 18 months out. I know that you don't remember this story, but I do. Um, and that is that um, I was their coach at Newcastle Eagles in that the year 2000 uh to actually the two years there and obviously the 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 week before the cup final your first the first club's trophy is that correct at the, the highest level was that the first yeah, one yeah and, right, yeah and of course we are beating you i think probably by at least yeah. 10 points the week before yeah. or two weeks before maybe and um and then and obviously you know robbie coached a great game and your team was so strong and lauren was like unbelievable um and you were able to win that first trophy so yeah i was uh, um i remember it very very well so that was the first trophy and then you know obviously I, 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 was robbie like you said, he was an incredible recruiter, but when he put those incredible teams on the floor, what was your, what were you doing in the background? Were you looking at Raising the, the money to put the team on the Raising floor. Raising the money, right, okay. Yeah. Raising the yeah. money. I can remember, I can remember when we, uh, we were looking to uh, recruit Tony Dorsey for that, 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 that jet wash team. We were looking to recruit Tony Dorsey and he ended up um, 
going to uh, Belgium, and and then um, uh, I, I mean we didn't really have enough money for Tony Dorsey, but I said, look, Tony Dorsey will put bums on seats. We'll make the extra money up. Go and get him. So he went back to I think it was Dan Davis actually at the time. It was it was his agent, sure. and uh, and uh, Robbie went back to Dan and said. Look, okay, we got the money, and he said, "Well, he's gone to Belgium now." But I have got this other kid, John McCord, That's right. who was just as good. And John McCord, and we looked. We, Robbie looked into because Robbie was so thorough about everything. He looked into John McCord's stats and details, and we got John McCord. John McCord was outstanding. And the other thing we did with that jet wash year was, I mean, we were we were lucky in that year because that was the ITV Digital year. That was when ITV Digital pumped in a lot of money, and then went bust, but still had to give us the money. So we had the money, and we put the money into the team. We got criticised a lot, not 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 developing the, the game and blah, blah, blah. But we were developing the team and developing the game through the team. And so we pumped the money into the team, um, and they had great accommodation, and uh, we just he put together a great team. Robbie was really good at putting together a great team. Not, not a, a great squad, not a long squad. No. He'd rather put Six money... Players. <laughs> into six players, quality <laughs> players, put all the money into six players and yeah. keep them on the floor than go with nine players and spread the talent, you know? Yeah. Um, well, how did you, can you tell us a quick story about how you got Piero Cameron? Piero Cameron. Um, I can't remember. It was, it was I can't, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm Robbie, not sure. Robbie got him. Yeah, I'm not sure how you ended up with him. I mean, it was, uh, you know, he ended up being such a linchpin of those teams. I mean, I never, ever... Oh, he was out. He was he, just... He was, uh, he was an outstanding player. I mean, he was a great person. He was a leader on the floor. We used to describe him as the glue. He was the glue for the team. He held the team together. No one would mess around with with, with, with Piero. And Piero was... He just had this way with him on the court that he pull them all in and he'd get them doing what we wanted him to do. Um, he, he was amazing. I mean, he made the all-star five in, in the world championships. Absolutely. The other four players were all NBA players. I mean, what more can you say? I remember when he left, you know, he'd been with us four years and he was moving on. And he it's said Mikey. to me, he said, yeah. he said, Mikey, he said, um, he always called me Mikey. Nobody else ever did, but he did. He said, I have to tell you, this is the first club that, that I've left. On, uh, on on such good terms, I said. Well, Piero, it says more about you than it does about us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, I mean, he, he he had his family with him, and they used to wreck the house. They, they, you know, we used to rent houses, and he used to wreck the house. And I just said, "Don't worry, that's all right, that's all right." And then the landlord would come in at the end of the tenancy and say, "What? Well, I'm going to put it all right. I put everything back. It cost us a few bob. I put everything back. Get it all right. It's all right. Don't worry. I'll get it all right. We get it all back back to back to normal again." And just didn't worry about it. He just wouldn't lose any sleep because he was doing it on the floor. And that's what you need. You have, to, one, you have to let him do it on the floor. One one of the most, I mean, and they've been incredible clutch players in the BBO history. You know, people like yeah. Terrell Myers and all those type of guys. But I, I, he's in my top five without even questioning it. He was one of the most clutch players I've ever seen. It was just a killer. We would be like every time this guy please take the ball out of his hands any of those other guys and you had you had four or five incredible other players but i would rather piero at the end of the game to make a, a big a big three or a big two or make get a foul and go to the line i've never seen anything but when like. you talk about big threes when piero came to us he couldn't shoot the three-pointer his <laughs> coach in new zealand wouldn't allow him to shoot the three he was all inside all inside and robbie just encouraged him to shoot the three. Got in a gym with him, worked with him in the gym. If his game was slightly off, he'd call him in early. He'd, he'd phone me at school and he'd say, is the gym free? When's the gym free today? Because, you know, we have the sports hall in the gym. And he, I'd say, oh, it's free from 10 till 11. He'd come, he'd phone Piero, he'd get him down there and he'd do extra sessions. He was always doing extra sessions with players if they if they just lost the sink a little bit. They just quite, weren't quite on the game. He'd call him in, get an extra session going. Uh, and he got Piero shooting the three, and and he became a great shooter. Great Piero, you know, just outstanding. But the, I mean, I remember how, how we got Piero because Robbie researched it, and his name was Cameron, and he thought that's a Scottish name, <laughs> right? A Scottish name. So he got him, and it turned out he had a granddad in Scotland. At one stage, he went up to see his granddad's. Um, yeah, uh, that's Scotland. right. I remember that story. So, so, yeah. So he he wasn't. We were you were allowed. Um, 
uh, uh, him like like you would be now. He's with a, with a birth thing, so he, he didn't qualify as a foreign player. So no, I gave us right. an extra player on the floor. Yeah, that's right. Um, after you know these incredible you know Chester Jet teams, you know Robbie eventually um, moves aside. I mean, what was the focus of you and the club there? And then kind of reset or, you know, still, you still had competitive teams at that time. Yeah. What, 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 what was your thought? Well, well, Robbie, Robbie went to Towers. I mean, he got the offer to go to Towers and I encouraged him to go because we didn't have the money then. Actually, digital money had gone. We didn't have them. And we knew how good he was, how good, a, how good the coach he was. Um, so I encouraged him to go to Towers. And the chairman went with him, funnily enough. Joe Lofthouse was a great friend of mine, a golfing mate of mine. Right. He he moved down down south and he went with him. So um, so basically, uh, Paul Smith, who has been another player that I coached as a junior, he took over um, and, and he won a trophy. He won the national trophy. He did very well, but we didn't have the money that we had in the past, and we weren't getting the distribution um, that we'd had from the league. So we were having to actually at one stage, put money into the league to keep it going. The money was tight. Uh, and without the money, you know, we only, I mean, Ellsbury, basically in Ellesmere Port, Chester, it's a small area, you know, it's 55,000 people in Ellesmere Port, you know. So it's tough to compete with big metropolises. Mm. Um, so it, it was tough to keep it going. Um, uh, we had different coaches then. Vic coached for a while. Um, uh, Billy Singleton coached. He came and coached. He, he he played with me for a few years. Um, so, yeah, we just kept it going, really. Yeah. And then, obviously, you know, coming more up to date, the the, 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 the club, you know, obviously, you know, changed names to, to Phoenix, um, you know, the new arena. Um, so it's almost kind of like, do you, do you count that almost as a new project, almost? Um, the time the club changed? Well, it's a continuation. And I think it's a continuation of what we've been doing. But the fact that we got the new arena woke me up a bit. You know, I got back involved a lot more because uh, I'd, I'd, I'd retired from school in 2006 and I'd taken time off from a senior team and other people had taken it over. But the chance to get an arena, a proper arena in, in, uh, in, the, t- in the town that I live in uh, got, me, uh, got me back involved. Uh, and, uh, you know, we could see that we could get a crowd. You know, we could, basketball was strong in the area. We had a great history. Um, so it's uh, and and to to get Ben involved, Ben won a trophy more than I ever did. I never won a trophy, you know. Robbie's won them, and Ben, Paul, Paul Smith, and Ben, <laughs> the guys that I coached, they won trophies. So, you know, they, they were doing great jobs. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, what what is that? I mean, does that give you you know this the sat- satisfaction from that perspective that you've mentored these? Well, first you were the coach to these these guys as players, and then you know mentoring them you know as coaches. Do you feel you know that's something that you've always enjoyed doing? And you know huge, that, that huge satisfaction from that, absolutely huge. I mean, it, even now, I mean, this year before uh, COVID came, I was trying to get involved. With two, we've got ten junior teams at the, at the Phoenix, and there's two guys that, that needed some help and support. So I was going one night a week and helping them uh, and and doing their level two coaching. Um, so I get huge enjoyment out of mentoring coaches, out of introducing the game to the youngsters. I get great enjoyment out of that. I'm just I'm just basketball mad basically. I yeah. can't leave it alone. When I left, I mean the netball was very very strong at my school and the. And when I left in 2006, the lady who coached netball, she left as well. They, they went, they won national titles as well. Um, but she stopped completely. You know, I see her now. She just doesn't have anything to do with netball at all. But I just, I can't leave it alone. Right. I can't leave and the basketball alone. You must be pretty proud, though, also, because um, your, the, the Chester Jet stroke Phoenix model is... It, with minus the, the the funding, but is is akin more to a European type style. There's a there's a there's a the location. Um, it's embedded in the community, and you're developing younger players who potentially can become you know professional players. But they're also in the system, and you've actually motivated people and 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 mentored people to actually take over coaching roles and other parts of roles in the club. I mean. 
I don't, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think there's any any club that's done that in this country. I mean, Leicester are, are starting to develop that now, but you know, this you know, it's definitely no, not historical. Well, I've always gone abroad. I've always wanted to get involved. I've always been. I've always, as I said earlier on about the time with Manchester United and Manchester Giants, and even at school, um, went from 2000 to 2008. Uh, even though I'd retired, I was still going with them. We were, we were going to a tournament in uh, in Spain where there were teams from all over Europe and America. We were taking school teams there. We were taking seven school teams, uh, boys and girls. So the Leedums, the three Leedum girls, they were coming there, going to Spain. And we were involved. And we were winning tournaments over there um, in uh, um, Lorette de Mar in Spain. And we've just always been involved in that sort of thing. And... and uh, I mean, originally, when one of the first teams I started in the, in the town, we became St. Saviors. And we used to go and play uh, tournaments in uh, Belgium and Holland and France. Um, just, just always wanted to expand. Them. And when you went there, they were, they were a community club. And that's what we, we, we feel we are. We are a community club. You know? I mean, we, we're the only community interest company in the BBL. So lots of the, the other teams have got owners and shareholders. Uh, we've just got a board that run it for not-for-profit uh, and, and we just put love and sometimes a bit of money into the team, you know, keep it going. <laughs> yeah, crazy, crazy, crazy the times in the, yeah, throughout this uh, period for, for British basketball. Um, uh, just on that question, because then I want to get go on to coaching again. Um, just your thoughts um you now seen you know a, an incarnation of like you know first the national league then you know going into the you know a kind of bbl product and then the heyday and then down and now it's pushing up what what's what's your thoughts for the future um of of, of basketball and specifically professional basketball in this country that's uh, a tough question, Tony, because for years people have been saying it's about to take off. It's about to take off. And as you said at the start, I've been in the game now just, for, just over 50 years and uh, it's been about to take off for a long time. Um, I think one of the biggest problems is that as a country, we're just, we're, we're hooked on, on soccer. I mean, I love football. I'm a Liverpool fan. You know, I love football, but I love lots. I love all sports, you know. I get involved in any sport. Um and I just want to win. Whatever sport I'm involved in, I just want to win. Um, but we as a country just seem so involved in soccer that it seems to be at the... Um, makes it difficult for other sports to succeed. You know? yeah. So I don't know, really. Uh, it needs a lot of input. It needs a lot of money going in there. We're starting to get the facilities which help. Um, but uh, who knows where we are at the moment with this current pandemic anyway, You know whether we'll ever get back to anything that's normal. I don't know. Mm. I wouldn't like to say. I couldn't make a prediction. Right. Um, moving on to, you know, your thoughts on, um, I mean, being someone that's been so prominent, especially you and Joe in that north northwest corridor about coaching, um, you know, the, the, the coaching fraternity, as I say it. I mean, what are your thoughts on, you know, where we are as a, as, as British coaches, as, as, a, as a fraternity? Um, yeah, just in general. I find that, I mean, I find that a tough question to answer. I don't really know. I've always done my own thing, to be honest, in my area. Uh, and I've always enjoyed talking to other coaches and learning from other coaches, as, as I've said earlier on. Um, but, uh, I mean, I enjoy meeting people as I go around, you know, uh, that I've known for years, like Paul James, you know, Um but I don't really know about the coaching fraternity. It's difficult to, to travel a long way. And uh, I suppose now with Zooms and what we're doing now, you can do a lot more of it, you know, sure. talk about it a lot. But I just like getting on the floor and working with, with but the teams. The, the, the point I would probably make is that, you know, your experience, you know, it's, 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 it's everyone could see. I mean, I saw it, you know, from such a young age anyway, you know, that, you know, what – the what you and Joe were doing up there was was incredible and you know like you said you know that was when I was in London I was actually 
myself and Joe were motivated to produce a Crystal Palace type program, you know, and follow the Roy Packhams. But, you know, yeah. do you think that these, the, the younger coaches at this moment, you know, they're, I mean, this is the reason why I tried to produce this series of trying to get some historical content, you know, try to give some advice. Um, do you, do you see younger coaches with that kind of mindset? Um, you know, do you see us trying to work together to improve the, 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 the game? What, any thoughts on that? I'm not as involved as I was at junior level. I was coaching under 19 level, a uh, high level for a long time. And I'm not involved in that now. I mean, last year I coached an under-14 team in the Northern Premier League and I saw coaches around there. I saw youngsters coming through uh, and, and, and starting coaching programmes. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, but I'm not involved at the under-18 level. Um, so I, I couldn't really say. But I, I would think that, that, yeah, I would think people are out there and, and interested in, and, and learning and working. It's just a question of whether they're going to get the right... Uh, help support and direction isn't it that's what it's all about yeah yeah and 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 is there any anything you want to add with regards to like the coach education process in this country do you was there something that you think that we're missing um that, that you know potentially you know that we should have um you know should be doing trying to do more of well I mean, I was fortunate. I was really fortunate to work with some great coaches at some really top clubs. And if people can get into those positions, that, that's how they're going to learn. Yeah. You know? Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting that, you know, there, there are not many coaches that I've like been lucky to talk to and interview on this, this series that haven't had that, you know, opportunity. I mean, I, I do wonder now if um, just watching YouTube and watching the NBA, uh, you know, that these, these young people are going to get um, the, 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 the knowledge, you know, like you said, I, you know, I was lucky, you know, my, my junior coach was Dave Tidmus and I've been exposed to all of those guys, Laszlo, Kevin Cadle, you know, Mark Dunning, all of these type of people yeah, yeah, have been yeah. my biggest influences, Joe Wyatt, you know, like yeah. incredible influences and like, you know, just incredible knowledge. I, 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 you know, I would be the first to admit that I would never be even close to being here if it wasn't for those people. So yeah, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it does worry me that people don't have that opportunity to get involved. And that's why such, you know, I was so excited to see Ben Thomas, you know, coaching, you know, at, at such a young age as well um, on your program. Uh, and, and I, you know, have constantly always uh, messaged him, you know, tried to give him some you know, minor advice, but more importantly, just support to say, hey, great job, you know, keep going, et cetera, et cetera, because there just isn't that many well, opportunities. Well, he is doing a great job and he did have a, what, what happened with, with Ben was I appointed a, a coach, Colin, uh, Colin O'Reilly, to coach the, uh, the senior team. Um, and he didn't do very well. And up to Christmas, um, we, we, uh, he'd only won two games. We were bottom of the league. And, and we had a, a clause in his contract whereby on the 20, from the 25th of December to the 1st of January, if he wasn't in a playoff spot, you know, we could ask him to leave. It wasn't a very nice time of the year and it wasn't a thing to do, but I had to do it. Tough decision, I had to do it. So, um, so I, I took over for three games, coaching for three games, and I invited Ben to be my assistant. And we went up to Glasgow to play Glasgow on uh, the 31st of December. And um, this was my first game back for a long time. And Ben was my assistant. Now, Glasgow at that stage were joint top of the league. They'd only lost two games and we'd only won two games. And I'm sitting on the bench coaching and Ben's sitting next to me and everything Ben said to me made sense. And I did it. He said, you know, maybe we should change that match up, change it. Everything he said, I did. We won the game in overtime. They were shell-shocked. Couldn't believe it. And in fact, Sterling Davis, who had mentored for his level three coaching course, that was probably the game that was a nail in his coffin and he ended up, at the end of the season, losing his job. Um, but I recognised right there and then that Ben could be a coach. Wow. And so I coached the next two games and I'd already committed Robbie to taking over. Robbie was going to take over after those three games. So right, Robbie yeah. took over, but he had problems, family problems he had to deal with after four or five games. So Ben came in 
coached the team for the rest of the season and then the next year coached it and won the national cup so yeah, yeah i just you can recognize you can you can being on the bench with them that, that's when you feel their presence and whether yeah. they've got it or not you know and, and you can see it in training session but it's not the same it's actually game coaching yeah and that's where you really learn i think um you know you you, you learn i i felt in my career i learned more as an assistant coach than i ever learned as a head coach being an assistant you learn from the person you have an extra pair of eyes but the pressure is not on you you can see things that they can't see absolutely uh, and you can advise them i remember working with kev cade was amazing i mean i remember he, he picked me as the assistant coach for england 91 to 93 i went into the european championships and we drew russia um uh, Denmark and Bulgaria and we went to Moscow we lost by three in Moscow we led the whole game and right at the end Martin Henlon missed the box out and the guy got in got the rebound put it in and Martin fouled him and we lost by three and uh, Kev went um, he wasn't very happy in the changing rooms afterwards let's put it like that because he had this he always had this thing you play hard for 40 minutes. You play hard for 40 minutes. So when they came to Manchester, the players in the second leg, we had to win by four. And we actually won the game by four. With two seconds to go, we had Trevor Gordon on the foul line shooting two free throws. He had to make them both. And he made them both. Now, what a night that was in Manchester. Yeah, I Beating remember that. You know? I remember that. Amazing. Unbelievable. Learned so much from Kev. Okay, four quick questions um, to finish up with. Um, I always put these in a different order now. Um, so your favorite drill, like do you have a favorite drill that you love love running? Favorite drill, right, okay. Well, listen, over the years, one thing I've learned, I learned this from Joe Forber is the best drill, the best drills are the ones you make up yourself. So yes. what I do is I look at my team, and I see what they need, both from training or from a game, particularly from a game where they're missing out on rebounds, with the opposition dominating the boards, and we'll work. And I'll rack my brain to come up with drills that will fit what we are lacking. So my favourite drills are the ones you make up yourself. And I got that from Joe Forbes. That's a that's in such a great point. Um, not many people have said it. Drill creation, and I, I, I think that's a lost art. I think that most of these younger coaches now just go hunting the hundred and fifty thousand drills, which there are. There's so many more. You know, ac you know, access to everything now: yeah. books, videos, you know, YouTube, everything. But yeah, yeah. Know, but if you're immersed in the game. It's going through your head, all the things you all did wrong, all the things you did wrong. Because yeah. when I lose a game, I don't sleep. You know, I'm, I'm awake in the middle of the night because it really bugs me. Not the same when you're an assistant coach. When no. you're the head coach, you're responsible. You don't sleep as a head coach very well at all. Never. So it's going through your head, going through your head. And you've got to change it for the next game. You know, yeah. you really have got to change it for the next game. Okay. Favorite go-to saying or statement? Nothing succeeds like success. Okay. I, I, like, I, I like to really play lots of games, work really hard. I like to get my teams into an, an attitude of winning. They've got to want to win. They've got to want to work hard. And, and nothing succeeds like success. That's, that's great. That's a great one. Uh, another great one. Um, favorite all-time basketball coach? Now, that's a tough one. That's a really, really tough one. Uh, I've got three, I'm afraid. Three, yeah, perfect. I've got three. Perfect. I've got three. At the top level, Kev Cadle has to be. Um, my own involvement, Robbie Pierce, and at junior level, no one can, for me can compete with Joe Foreman. Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm really happy you came up with those three names. That's awesome. And then lastly, which is becoming really an unfair question to almost anyone, but um, have you got two or three favourite players that you really enjoyed coaching um, over your career? Well, my, my coaching has, has involved seniors and juniors um, in equal amounts, probably. So I've got one from each, really. Uh, okay. And we've mentioned them both already, I'm afraid. Uh, Piro Cameron has to be my 
all-time favourite. I mean, it's 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 close with uh, with Lauren Meyer because he did things on the floor that I never saw anybody else do. But Piero Cameron for me was the complete player. If he if, if he'd have been maybe a stone lighter, a little bit more athletic and could jump, he'd have been in the NBA. Oh, yeah. I mean, he he was drafted by the Celtics, but he wasn't an NBA body. Um, but what what a player, what a person, uh, what a winner, a real winner. And I learned things from him that I didn't learn from anybody else. I can remember him talking to me about shooting. Um, and, you know, he, he'd say, you've got to be set when you get the ball and you've got to be flexed at the knees so as you catch the ball, you're going up straight away for the shot. You know, lots of players catch it, go down, they go down and up. And that split second is enough to get the defender on you and take away the easy out open shot. Yeah. And so... And I stress this all the time. And I never knew that. I, I mean, I'd been on loads of coaching courses and worked with lots and lots of players. But, you know, in the early 2000s, Piero saying that to me, you know, really brought it home to me how important that little split second was. Get your knees flexed, get the ball ready, insist on your, 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 your players with you, giving you the ball in the shooting pocket. And as soon as you catch it, let it go. Um, so that was my junior player. Uh, my senior player and the junior player, it's a tough one because I've coached so many great junior players. Um, you know, Jason Crump, you know, we went to the junior cup final at the Royal Albert Hall, played against Humph Long's team, East London Royals. Yep. Um, Royal Albert Hall, what a place to play the junior cup final! Incredible. I was there, and we had I would have been there. Sorry, I would have been there. I'm almost would have uh, been there. Yeah, and John Atkinson did the stats. Right, we never had stats at junior, at junior <laughs> games. Probably. So John Atkinson did the stats. So at the end of the game, we'd won the game. We were over the moon. Looked at the stats. John Amici was playing, and John Amici had ten point, no eight points and ten rebounds. Now to be fair, he hadn't been playing as long as Jason Crump, sure. but Jason Crump had thirty-one points and twenty-nine rebounds wow. in the junior cup final. Oh boy. Absolutely outstanding, um, and you know. I can remember coaching him when he was 15, picking him up. I got a phone call off somebody who said, there's this big kid walking, he lives in our village, just outside Chester. Uh, and I think he might be interested in basketball, you know, Mike. So I got a phone number and I rang him up and he started, he started um, playing and coaching, started coaching him. And everything I told him to do, he did it a hundred times. I had another guy who lived in the village saying to me, there's this big kid walking around the village with his hands in the air, walking around the village with his hands in the air. As I said to him, you've got to get used to get your hands up. You've got to get your hands up, get your hands up. And, any, and he had a back, he had a basket, dad put a basketball ring on the side of his house, big house. And, and he, everything I worked with him, practice, practice, practice. Now, if it hadn't been for his knees, I believe he'd have made the NBA. Um, wow. So, favourite player of all time? Probably Jason Cole. Okay. But it is Jason Cole. It is Jason Cup. That's awesome. What a great way to, to finish it. Um, coach, listen, I've, I've you know been a real admirer of the, everything you've done. Um, you've been, you know, someone that's been there from, like I said, from right from the start, but more importantly, just a linchpin, you know, in, in the, even in, in the BBL in the, in the bad times. So I just want to say thank you uh, for, uh, for being on today. Um, and you know, good luck for the rest of the, 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 the season. If there is a season, I hope there is. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just thankful that we got a chance to, to, to learn this story. Tony, it's been my pleasure. Great talking to you. Thank you.